So thank you everyone for joining today. I'll keep an eye on the chat. We have some some great guests coming from our, our BRP partners down in Tampa. Um, but I'm going to kind of start just as a reminder of, of our group here, HRIQ, why we're all together here. Um, you know, what we've done over this past year is this people experience. This has been super important. Um, and interestingly enough, we were talking with people at our networking event. I've, I've never had a time where there have been more management level and up HR professionals looking for new work. So for whatever reason, it could be financial, could be culture. It's typically something on this wheel here that we're looking at. And, you know, some people it might've been, oh, you know, I've kind of reached my ceiling at the company I'm in, but I still want to keep growing. So maybe I want the next challenge, et cetera. So it's really important. And, and I think we know that all of our employees are evaluating these things kind of on an ongoing daily basis. This is a living, breathing thing. It's not something you set it and forget it. So, you know, we're going to focus a lot of our conversations around this. You can kind of weave in really any topic around your, your people, your, your, your culture into one of these areas. And so today we're picking a very specific one um, around physical well-being, but even more specifically mental well-being and how it affects all these different areas within this people experience. So as we talk the first time, we want to remember, you know, we want some tangible takeaways with this. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're giving these sessions with the understanding that we know the challenges behind the scenes. We know there's budgeting. We know, especially with anything around, around wellness, just in general, it's, it's tough to give an ROI to it. So it's hard to make a business case to, to invest in these areas. We're hoping at the end of today, there's, you know, there's a little bit different, um, different tone to that. And then, you know, aligning with your strategic goals and having some measurements on it. And we have some things as we close out where there are actually some takeaways where you can do some measurements on some of these things that might be a little bit more intangible. As a reminder, the whole reason we worry about this people experience is exactly what I mentioned. We want people to stay. The cost of hiring and recruiting is super expensive. And we want to make sure that this people experience, we, we want everyone to be a, a workplace of choice, a best place to work. We want to make sure that your people appreciate, you know, everything that you do for them as an employer. So the uh, the one quick thing that we actually did do before we get going, so at our networking event, so you see on our call here, we have Carly and Chloe. They started a networking group for professionals just starting their careers in HR. And so one of the things is that as they've folded members into their group, where they now I have, I think, over like 50 members in their group, um, these were two of the biggest questions that came up. And it was a, a networking, they were kind of both um, revolving around networking a little bit, but one of them was, you know, networking, where do I go? And, but the other one was, what has most significantly influenced or developed your career in HR? And, and this this is something that came out from one specific person I talked to. All of the responses were kind of the same, but you need to invest in yourself and you need to have a plan for yourself. And that was kind of the, the overarching theme. And if you have someone that can help you get from where you are today to where you want to go tomorrow and then help you figure out where you want to go after that, that's super, super important. So we actually had a bunch of people at the NIR event interested in mentoring um, some of the people just getting into HR. So if anyone on this call has an interest in that, you know, we're not looking for a gigantic time commitment, but it's more just a, 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 an ear to listen here and there. Um, we, we'd love that. So if you wanted to reach out just sort of separate from that, but it was, this was just something that came out of that event that I thought was really important. And, um, you know, kudos to, to Chloe and Carly for getting their group going. So this is what we're digging into today. So a different story about mental well-being. And this says well-being. We're focusing specifically on the mental side. You'll see as we get going. But this was a book recommended from Carrie and McKenzie that I'll introduce here in a second. But this well-being at work, um, I know we've we've mentioned books before, and I think it's something good for I've tried to read more this year. I haven't haven't been super great about it, but I'm trying to make a point to do that more. But this is a good if you're looking, if you're someone who reads or someone who listens to audio books. It's a really good book to sort of hit home the point that we're going to be talking about today. So we have our fancy disclaimer. We want to make sure that um, everyone, you you have people that you trust in your circles. You know, we're more than happy to have these conversations as well, but just make sure you understand this is sort of, you know, our views of these things. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our awesome population health leaders at Baldwin Risk Partners, both Carrie and Mackenzie. As you can see, I, I don't want to rip through their entire resumes, but they've been instrumental in helping us um, 
advance this topic of this people experience, this well-being, and, and their viewpoints behind this and what they've done to help with our clients really have framed the past year that we've spent talking about this. And as you'll see when we go through, it's really helping to, to make the business case that it's important to invest here. And here are some ways that we can do that. Here are some things that you can share with your team so they can kind of connect the dots on you know, how one area doesn't just affect that, that specific silo. It really has a much more expansive effect across all the different ways, you know, your, your finance teams, your, your people teams, your ops teams, and your HR teams, obviously. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Carrie. Carrie, I'm going to flip through the slides. So if I, if I <laughs> sleep on one of these slides, just, just let me know, but we'll, uh, we'll get going and I'll pass it over to you and off we okay. go. Thanks, Jeff. I'm um, really happy to be here, and hopefully um, you will find a lot of great nuggets of information um, throughout this presentation. I apologize. I have a little bit of a cold, so if I have to mute real quick, I'm just going to do a quick cough. So anyhow, um, today, these are the learning objectives that we really want to make sure that you have in front of you that help help and allow you to build out a strong business case. There is a story to tell about how you can do well-being differently in your workplace, and the one thing I really want you to be able to take away from this is that you can create change in the workplace and it doesn't have to, have to be hard and it doesn't have to necessarily be costly. So Mackenzie and I work on a team together and you'll notice what's different about our model is that we have a nurse, myself, paired with a well-being consultant who has her master's in um, uh, public health. And so as a nurse, I was trained to take care of sick people, didn't spend a lot of time taking care of the, the well people or learning how to continue to keep the well people healthy. Um, and so we made sure that our model involved, um, you know, joining arms together so that we are covering cultural, behavioral health, uh, chronic conditions. Those are important. And how do we keep the healthy healthy? And so going forward, I, I just want to give you that background so you understand where we're both, we're both coming from a different place to get to the same place. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Yep. This is a little bit about just where we are and who we come from. Our background is with BRP. Um, we have 150, I, I won't go through all of this, but again, what we know is that what we call the built environment, where we work, where we spend the majority of our time is the workplace. And we know that 80 to 90% of our health outcomes depend on those external and environmental factors that we put ourselves into. And so it's really, really, really important that we um, gain um, buy-in and that you're able to build effective business cases going forward to bring well-being into your environments. And I'm sure many of you recognize this um, logo, but what Lululemon did is they actually commissioned a study, an online study, and it was managed by a third partner. It actually had some really um, impressive responding totals, about 14,000 um, people responded. Uh, those people were 18 and older. But what we learned is that one in three people feel their well-being is lower than it's ever been before. And this was actually done um, between May and June of this, this current year. So it's pretty up to date. What we know is that when your well-being is low, that you experience life in a very different way. A lot of people, over half of, of the respondents said that they fell behind in their personal and work responsibilities. They felt their well-being really affected their relationships, not just their work relationships, but their interpersonal relationships as well. And many people are struggling just to get out of bed. And why is that relevant? Obviously, when people don't get out of bed, they don't come to work, right? Um, or if they're coming to work, they're not coming to work at 75, 90, 100 percent of themselves. And so the question came about how many work days actually are missed on average from low well-being. And um, the study showed that about five days on average in the past 12 months are attributed to low well-being. And when you look at that by market segments um, across different countries, you see that we're kind of right in the middle there. Um, obviously, Spain and Japan and South Korea are doing something different. I think a lot of people know about siestas that people take over in um, some of the um, Eastern countries and or Western countries. And so there's a lot um, that I think that there can be gleaned to learn from this. So, and what we also learned is that there's a significant misunderstanding between what the C-suite un understands about their employees and what the employees feel that they're being understood about their well-being. And so many employees report their well-being significantly lower than what their C-suite assesses their well-being to be. And we know that there's always a cost to doing something, but there's also a cost to doing nothing. 
Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I think this is a really nice illustration of what happens when you have unhealthy workplaces, whether that be unhealthy because people aren't taking care of their um, physical health, but also their mental health. And so work-related stress, that is a big component of what happens when people are unhealthy in the workplace. Decreased productivity and increased cost occur and at the tune of a lot of money. So um, as you can see, lots of money, trillions and billions here, but this is a really nice slide if you have to illustrate what happens when you don't invest. And a big part of well-being is really about the connections that you have with people. And so understanding that it's not just chronic condition management. It's when people get work, hurt at work. It's also, how are you managing workers' comp? Um, how are you managing stress within the workplace? And then what happens when people are actually disengaged and you have presenteeism at work? So there's a lot of money there that- Yeah, and Carrie, this was the slide where, you know, for me, you know, the numbers are obviously big. It's easy to to, to focus on gigantic numbers on the screen, but it's an all-encompassing conversation. We've we've had conversations over the course of the year at some of our events where, you know, well wellness, quote unquote wellness, which I've sort of, you know, we've transitioned to the term well-being was very siloed. And it was siloed in a very specific department that might have had a very specific budget tied to it. And, you know, often that budget wasn't gigantic because as we mentioned, some of the ROI is tough to mention. But when you see things like this, it really does connect to every part. It's it's not just okay, wellness is their own person. You know, we have one person that handles wellness in our company. A lot of times that person has, you know, other HR responsibilities, but it really is a much more macroeconomic conversation about that. That That's why we keep going back to that people experience. So this was one that, you know, as building a business case, we've used this a couple of times with clients where, you know, this was the slide where we kind of used it to to pull it all back together as this one all encompassing. You know, this is a this is a culture. This isn't just a a vertical inside of our company. You know, surrounded around like the term wellness. Yep, absolutely, great point. And I think where we like to take that a step further is we spend a lot of time talking about the intersection between commercial risk and employee benefits. And so it's not just a one a one silo on either side safety and wellness should be intersecting. And so you'll see us um, in other presentations spend time on that. So great point. Gallup actually said 69% of the U.S. workforce, they're not engaged at all. They're just not engaged. So we've got a lot of work to do here. And the evidence, you know, it does back what we're saying. There's a lot of studies always, um, you know, willing to read these types of studies, but we, we understand it's always stood to be true that if you take care of your people, they'll take care of the business. So if we're for businesses to succeed, it's people, we really need to have mentally and physically healthy people in the workforce. So this is a bit of a case study. So hold on here with me. I'm going to give you some background here. Um, nearly half of all Americans have identified they don't use their time off. A little concerning, um, here at BRP, we actually instituted unlimited PTO, and it got a lot of attention. A lot of people um, were really excited about it. But in theory, what we've learned is that people actually take less time off um, because a, a lot of reasons. They don't really know what to do. They're afraid of being per perceived as a slacker. You know, there are no boundaries around how how much can I take, how little should I take, um, and so it just has created somewhat of a little bit of a cycle. Of, you had four, what do I do? What well, is this? Um, the I nine is the. Uh... I'm going to mute. Yeah. Thanks. Got it. There you go. Thank you. Um, and so I was reading a study about the CEO of Simpla Flying. Um, it was a smaller company, but he noticed that a lot of his team members were not taking time off or that they hadn't taken time off in a very long time. And they were appearing very overworked. Um, he decided to try something different. And he said his teams, he felt his teams could be more productive with mandatory time off. And when I read that, I was like, let me read that again. Mandatory time off. And what he meant by that is everyone must take a week off every eight weeks. And he realized that was going to come with a lot of um, pushback, probably more than anything. But he said on that week off that you are required to take, if you log in and you say anything via email, your internal teams or your internal Slack, um, you're punished for that and you will not get paid. So um Interestingly enough, after they did that for a couple of years, he also discovered that it really wasn't a, about the length of a vacation time. It's about the frequency. So it's mo most important that you have frequent time off. And after another year or so, he, he was continuing to study this and he found that productivity, creativity, and employee happiness were all up. So, you know, there had to be some rules. It couldn't be the Wild West out there. 
he had he said timeout had to be spaced off spaced out obviously you had to have backups to cover who was going to be out um, and then clients needed to be alerted in plenty of time to let them know but understandably what we found and what we know and what I think the CEO found is that if your people are using their vacation time or their PTO time to actually recover rather than rejuvenate there's a problem within the culture of that environment so um, and you can actually hear more about this on this uh, podcast, Work Life. It's a TED podcast with Adam Grant's phenomenal podcast. Yeah, and Carrie, we, we've talked, we've gotten direct feedback at some of our HR networking events that this, the the whole return to work, that that concept of people that are working remotely, whatever, it it speaks directly to this because people don't, they don't turn on or shut off. It's just, yeah. it's just a constant on. It's just, yeah. there's never an off button. So even if, even if leadership teams aren't asking people to, hey, you need to make sure you're plugged in at nine o'clock at night. And I don't think anyone out there is doing that. But what happens is, you know, some of your best people are constantly plugged in and that creates the burnout amongst your best people. And that's where some of this mandatory time off, I think that can help. It can help ease up some of that burden of of the people that just don't, it's it's hard to it's hard to put it down and it's hard to shut off. And those again are your best people that are behind all your goals and in and in, in initiatives. So exactly. All right. Bear with me here. This is a little busy, but this is where we want to talk about the history of wellness as it was initially called. It dates back as far as the 1800s. Um, and a lot of the influence from the 1800s still exists today. So we'll start in the lower left. You'll see between the 1800s and 1950-ish early. 50s, there was this social and recreational phase that was developed initially by the Pullman Company. So you see the Pullman Company, the Pullman Cars, um, they actually established what they called athletic, well, what we know today as athletic associations. Um, and they created company towns where you lived amongst the people you worked with. You had a doctor, you had your fire department, militia, all the things were within your company town. Um, and because of that, they developed teams amongst the town to compete. Um, after that, in the 1800s, um, National uh, Cash Register Company, their, their president was known to meet their employees on horseback. They would ride before work. So you had, you know, um, the ability to, to talk with your leadership. Uh, they also are um, the ones that later developed daily work breaks. So twice a day, they, they had a gym that they built and they actually contributed 325 acres of a recreation park for their workers to use. They were also the first to develop what they called daylight factory buildings. So they had floor to ceiling glass windows that could be opened to let in fresh air, help ventilation, improve lighting. They began offering hot lunches. Um, again, baths, showers, exercise programs, the professional clubs, the social clubs, all those things were wrapped in it. They did one more thing though. They included an on-site doctor, which is where we come start building the steps to where we get to some of the more recent things like on-site clinics and things of that nature. Then we move on into the 50s and you'll see that's when we saw the spark of EAP beginning we saw OSHA come in and um, build out some some laws and rules um, again if you look a little bit further into the 50s and forward we know that the interstate systems developed and with that started um, fast food so you can start to see what's happening in the trajectory of the well-being history um, the having all of these fast foods, it really changed what people do when they're eating. And you think about it, it kind of gave way to the um, the dinner going away at the table with your family. The things, the good things that came from that um, have been taken over by fast food. So interestingly enough, uh, Congress also came in, started the Cigarette Smoking Act, um, you know, health warnings were coming out, those types of things. And again, OSHA developed in the 70s. Then we move on um, to the upper left and you see the medical phase of well wellness is developing that focus on chronic condition and disease management executive health programs um, focusing on how can we align health related co costs that are are being put on the employer to work-life balance became something that was born as a phrase the hras biometric screenings health fairs behavior change programs all started to become kind of the standard that we talk about but there began to be a sharp emphasis on ROI for those things. How do we control cost, improve access, and improve quality of care? So again, the on-site clinics became more, um, they occurred at, at a more fast pace and they were occurring at different places. And I also think back to this and I remember all those Jane Fonda exercise videos and all the things that started exploding with workout classes. 
um, Richard Simmons, by the way, I don't think he's lost. I think they found him. Um, and then we move on to 2020 in the current environment. We think about the things that have happened after COVID um, really, really has created this focus of how do we get people back to work? How do we combine determinants of health, social determinants of health, food deserts, all the things that are keeping people able to access the healthy way of living. So it's, it, you hear a lot of times the total worker initiative, um, you know, that is still occurring. Um, there's been an increased focus on what the environment looks like, all the things we're talking about today, but really fusing all of that together so that it creates um, mental, emotional resources that keep you being healthy um, along with your physical health. Um, the Healthy People 2000 program came about. And again, just all of the advances that we've seen in social wellness have emerged as well. So, um, you know, I don't know if anyone has any questions about this. I know this is a lot, but if you do, I'm I'm happy to spend a little bit more time on this. Yeah, and I I know just for us, for for personally, obviously outside of doing you know insurance benefits things, this is all we talk about. I mean, this is this is something that has been the nonstop topic of conversation about you know what what else can we do in this arena in order to provide X Y and Z for our employees to make sure that they have all the resources that they need. And so that's been that's been the ask, and it's so it's a function of you know next is, yeah, let's make sure that we can actually bring some solutions. Yeah, and one thing I think I, I would like to add to that past slide, you don't need to go back, but really that there's been an increased focus on how can we support people with alcohol and substance abuse disorders. Twenty three million Americans were estimated to be in recovery, um, and so sub being able to maintain sobriety in this environment is is really really hard. So there has become this um, influence of certified professional recovery coaches that has been emerging as well. And, you know, really, again, what did COVID do? It, it really brought the emphasis to mental health globally, it, the appearance of it. And it, you know, people are afraid. And the economic environment now, 40% of people say that they don't, they, ha they are not considered, they are not looking forward to thinking they'll be better off in five years from now. So that that's really discouraging. And Globally, well-being um, levels have not improved over the past three years. I think everybody thought, oh, the light at the end of the tunnel, things will get better. That's not what's happening. So uh, there's been this really, again, remember that that statistic, one in three people say their well-being is lower than it's ever been before. And the other part of this is most employees say that their health has worsened or stayed the same since prior year, but their their executives actually believe that their workforce has improved. So there's this this disconnect that's occurring. Um, and again, 41% of people saying they feel hopeless is just a very discouraging place to be. And so we have to address it. Yeah. And I think the feedback I've heard on the the executive side, because obviously there's a huge delta here. It's, it's sure. you know, it's three quarters of executive thinks people's health has, you know, mental well-being has improved where the reality is, you know, two thirds say it's it's been worsened or it's the same. So where's the disconnect there? And I think, you know, from the from the conversations that I've had, there's a lot of um, executives promoting positivity, which makes sense. So that makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. executives being positive in something that's that's new, but it's a function of understanding the reality at the same time. There's a difference between being positive and then ignoring the facts of there are people within the population struggling. We actually need to do something about it. And so that's the one that's the one thing that we've seen that's been really hard to close those two gaps of you know, making sure executives understand that this is really how it is. And there are some at the back end of this, we'll have some some tools to help sort of take a temperature of what this looks like. Again, more research. Um, but really what all this is saying here is that the pandemic has really worsened everyone's health, but our executive teams need to realize how much their employees are still struggling. Not that they just struggle, they're still struggling. Um, and again, um, sorry, hold on a second well-being programs when they focus on the individual at work. So what's happening when you're there uh, is a different approach than when you actually focus about how the individual is, is actually in the work. Are they happy? Are they, you know, are they, are they just there and they're just pumping out things? They don't really have any enthusiasm for what they do. And I think, you know, we've heard a lot about Gen Z or Gen Xers and the millennials and Gen Zers and all the things that We've heard a lot of negatives, but I think there's a lot to be said for some positives that they are lead, they could be leading some change here. So if we looked at 
um, executive Gen Zers and millennials, they were significantly more likely than their older counterparts to report, report that they prioritize their well-being and work-life balance. So they're not willing to work more. They are willing to make sure that their work-life balance is in check and they're more likely to be more transparent in their workplace. So that in itself is positive. And I think that that's one place we can take um, and move forward with. One of the places that we've been looking for a, a additional resources and how do we really assess well-being? Because a lot of times it's the fluffy, right? People, it's just hard. It's hard to put an ROI to wellness. Um, Mayo Clinic released um, a well-being index back, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. And really what they did is they did it to assess their doctors, nurses, medical students, all their healthcare workers to figure out why they were burning out. They obviously knew the pandemic, but they wanted to understand meaning in their work and their work-life integration. So they developed this amongst 120,000 providers, but they've taken it a step further to where it can be applied to different organizations. It doesn't have to be in the healthcare sector, but and over 800 organizations have actually used this to date um, to go beyond burnout and the pandemic. And I'll let Mackenzie take the next few slides. All right. So these next few slides are kind of revolve around our population health and well-being team's philosophy and also some practical, easy ways that you can integrate wellness into your workplace. So this slide is one of our big philosophies on our team is to make wellness the easy choice. And we have a playbook that we give to our clients that has a few statements shown here as to what we believe well-being is. And one of those is that well-being should be for everyone. It should be experienced daily. Uh, second is the built environment is a very important and easy way to make behavioral change. And we'll get to that here in a second. And that wellness should be the path of least resistance. So again, it should be the easy choice. And on this slide, um, another philosophy is that, you know, wellness doesn't have to be complicated to work. And actually it can be really easy and effective. Um, and so these examples here are a few examples of how to integrate wellness into your environment. Um, and the environment is actually a huge opportunity and a effective way to make behavioral change. I think research actually indicates it's about 40%. Um, so big way to make change there. So you see here, we have a plant on this slide. I know personally, I don't know if anyone else here, you can drop in the chat box if you feel the same way, but as soon as I step outside or I'm in nature, I instantly feel better. And so there's a lot of research that talks about the, uh, how effective plants are at increasing your well-being. They make it easier for us to breathe. They reduce, there's, uh, indicates there's an increase of serotonin that happens when we're around plants. So it helps to calm us, make us feel less stressed. I know people in my office, if you walk around, there's some people that have either fake plants or some real plants. So there's some science behind the effectiveness of just having plants and some greenery in your space. And I'm going to let Carrie take the rocking chair one, because I feel like she's passionate about that. <laughs> Um, I'm older than Mackenzie, so she, <laughs> anyhow, <laughs> the, the other thing is, is NASA actually did a, a, ground a groundbreaking research and they found that plants actually do remove 87% of airborne toxins. So they are really cleaning our environment up. And so uh, going forward with that, I think you can drop some cheap plants in the office, just make sure you're watering them. Um, in terms of the rocking chair, I travel an awful lot um, for work. And I just noticed, particularly in the Charlotte airport, everybody sits in these rocking chairs and I just, it's a great idea. I just didn't know the history behind it, but what they found within the um, airport, they, they actually had a photography exhibit come in and they, you know, it was about sitting on, sitting on front porches and they used the rocking chairs as props around this exhibit. Well, when they were ready to cl close up the exhibit, people wouldn't get out of the rocking chairs. And so the Charlotte airport, that is actually how the rocking chairs came to be there. And what they found was rocking chairs are the antithesis of what what you feel happens at an airport, right? You're rushing, you're always late, you're trying to get to your gate, it's very stressful. You sit down in a rocking chair and you rock. Um, there are studies that talk about self-soothing, rocking, we rock babies, all those things. So that act of rocking actually brings not only mental, but physical re relief to a lot of people. And in fact, there was a young Senator from Massachusetts who had chronic back pain. And that senator actually became one of our presidents. So JFK, he actually acquired over 14 rocking chairs in the White House. He even had one on Air Force One. And that was because he had chronic lower back pain and his doctor had prescribed rocking chair therapy. 
So again, doesn't have to be hard, doesn't have to be costly. It's about the environment that you want to create within your offices. All right. So I, I was going to, I had, I had the question of what the rocking chair, I wanted to save it for this because I had no idea why the rocking chair was here, mm -hmm. but I can attest they have rocking. So I play golf. They have rocking chairs like outside on the patios at golf courses. There's nothing more relaxing than sitting on a rocking chair and just sort of zoning out for a little bit. Might not be, maybe not the best thing for an office for all day, but just something It was interesting though. I, I, I had the question of what it was for. So it's interesting to hear that story. Yeah. I was in the Knoxville airport about two weeks ago and Carrie had told me about this rocking chair, you know, wellness situation previously. And it was in the bathroom. So I took a picture and sent it to her, but you, I had no idea prior to that, that the benefits of rocking chairs. So um, the last thing on the slide here is the Stanley cup. And so just keeping a water cup at your desk and um, here at BRP, we have uh, fresh water available filling stations. So as soon as my water comes empty, I have a um, opportunity to get up, walk around, fill up my cup, maybe talk to some people and come back to my desk. So we actually also at one of the other offices, we took up just everybody put in about $25 and we got one of those um, nugget ice machines. It's a countertop one. And I'm not really great about drinking water as, as bad as that sounds, but that is the one way it's, it's actually changed my life having that nugget ice machine. And it seems so simple and so silly, but um, it is, that's kind of one of the things that I, I love how McKinsey says it has to be the easy, you have to make it easy. The choice has to be easy. Yeah. Easy choice. And then something that um, you don't even have to think about too. So, you know, you finish drinking your water, obviously your brain's like, yep, I need more water. So you're not making it a super difficult choice where you have to, you know, do 20,000 steps a day or something to win a certain prize. Um, you're making it easy. Um, another thing that we talk about is, um, you know, you can have the best wellness ideas in the world. You could have the best program, but unless you have it integrated into your cultural culture at your workplace, it's not going to make a difference. So involving wellness, um, as a cultural change as well. And so these are a few ideas of how to kind of integrate wellness into your culture. Um, another important thing to note here is that it's important to have leadership buy-in. And so, Again, you could have the best ideas in the world, but unless you have leadership buy-in and they're participating, then it's probably not going to work. So up there on the top right is a program called Record Setter. Um, it was a program founded with the belief that every person on this earth is capable of doing, of being the best at something. And so um, that's a fun little way to tie into your workplace and do uh, fun little challenges and maybe set a record set or world record. I know I've participated. I have a few colleagues here and we're all competitive at work. And um, I did a blank <laughs> challenge, which is not unique enough to be on the record set or world challenge, world record challenge. But um, that was posted up on LinkedIn and we had a few people participate. That was really fun. So just doing little challenges like that. Um, we've We've, we went down to our office gym um, that's in our office building a few months ago, and we did a hanging challenge. A few of us like <laughs> hanged on a few of the pull-up bars in there. So, um, and that's a great way to build some team bonding as well when you get competitive. So, um, so that's record setter. Um, you see the birthday, birthday cake over there. Um, one idea and way to integrate in this into your culture is to have birthday PTO. So I know I like to use my PTO on my birthday. We don't currently have that as a benefit, but having um, the opportunity to take your birthday off um, is a great way to integrate that into your culture as well. Um, you see their little badge that says happiness coordinator. Um, you could create cultural infusion positions such as a CHO. So having a chief happiness coordinator. Um, Carrie and I have a client that um, they actually don't have titles at their uh, business. I don't know if they, I don't know if this is still current as in 2023, um, but there was one person that had a title and it was their plant manager. And can anyone guess what that person did? Water the plants. They watered the plants. <laughs> yeah. It was the only person in the company of like a thousand people that had a title and his job was to water the plants. So having quirky little titles like that. Um, and then you see the fresh harvest. I actually have a few clients that do this where they will use their wellness funds or will just budget so many dollars a year to have fresh fruit delivery to their workplace. Um, at BRP, our offices have fresh snacks as well. So we don't 
um, do the deliveries, but we always have fresh almonds, pecans, some oats, if people want to make oatmeal, Cheerios at our office. So um, having healthy snacks available as well. And then, um, of course, we've talked about the built environment. We've talked about integrating it into your culture. Another effective way to make behavioral change is just doing simply communication. And we found that with our clients tying um, wellness communications into benefits communications um, is a great way to um, plug in wellness and benefits because benefits are usually only talked about once a year during open enrollment. So we have a annual well-being calendar. That calendar has monthly themes that are connected to our monthly newsletter, um, as well as videos that go out monthly with the same theme. Um, and then we're also helping our clients again with those that have wellness funds. We have resources on how they can spend their wellness funds. So um, just having communication readily available is another important way to Talk about yeah. wellness. And anyone looking for that calendar as well, I, I think I just heard that the 2024 calendar is close or just about ready. So anyone looking for the ready. calendar, um, we'd be more than happy to, to share that. So if you want to shoot us a note, whether it's in the LinkedIn group or just shoot us a note on the side, we'd be more than happy to share the calendar. But it does help for our clients. It's really helped sort of drive the ongoing messaging. So it's something that, you know, sometimes it's hard if we want to stay, quote unquote, in touch with employees. Well, how do we do that and kind of have a some kind of theme to it that's not just, hey, how are you doing this month? Are you being, you know, are you being healthy? Are you eating healthy? This and that. So it uh, it's actually worked out really well for us. Uh, 2024. Absolutely, Amy. We'll definitely we'll absolutely shoot that calendar out. Um, I think I have the the chat saved. So I'll make sure when I send out the 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 presentation and the recording that we'll we'll include the calendar with that for everyone as well. Okay, and then Carrie, I think you're jumping. Yep, in. I'm back. So Deloitte is is someone we we like to follow. Um, they had a well-being at work survey, and what they found is that there's three steps that need to occur to begin unlocking being in the workforce. One of them is really employ empowering your managers. And when we say managers, I'm really thinking more about mid mid level managers that are you know they're there with the employees day to day. They're understanding what they're going through. We have to educate them so that they're able to. A, recognize what's going on and B, have the resources that they need at their fingertips to, to deploy so that we're not, you know, paralyzing them in those situations. And so there's a lot of different resources, mental health uh, first aid. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it is a training program um, that is wonderful. It gives you local resources, um, also talks to your, how to talk to your middle management about how to handle mental emergencies at work, promoting accountability amongst your executives and um, you know, again, that ROI, really being able to study the outcomes of the programs that you put in place. And that's something that we, we feel very strongly about when we start putting in programming for our clients, we make sure on the tail end of it, we have identified KPIs or, you know, goals that need to be met. And we're measuring those based on data and also surveys. And so we spend a lot of time with our clients circling back around to make sure that we're focusing not only on the data, but also the human outcomes. So we have a lot of qualitative tools that we use that are not just quantitative data tools that we're also using in conjunction. And we got some some feedback in the chat as well that Karen mentioned she's certified in the mental health first aid. So highly Excellent. recommended. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, it's a great thing. And then, you know, once you have developed your well-being program, how do you, how can you keep it current, keep it going? Whose attention do you need? You do need your C suite buy-in and, and that goes, you know, not it's not just money though. It's testimonials. It's how your leaders are leading the company. How do you how do you connect that with the mission and the vision of the, the total company's overall um, you know, cultural expectations, the things that they lead with, and being able to create that business case for them. They can't just, you can't just go in and say we need this. You've got to give them uh, these are the things we need. These are the th what what's going to cost and what's the expected ROI. Those are things we help our clients with. And the cultural perspective obviously needs to be considered. And you also need to really ask your colleagues, we call um, our co-workers colleagues, but we, we need to know how they feel and what they need. And sometimes that's a fine line, right? You don't, we always say we don't really like a lot of open-ended questions on surveys, but they still need to be there. So, um, so 
handling those types of things. And then what does this, you've got to develop the story. What does it need to say? What does the data tell you? Those quanti quantitative type details. What do your colleagues tell you? The qualitative, the surveys, all that kind of stuff. And then communicate that and use your, use those resources to build that story out. And workplace wellness is the only sector that actually shows a strong and statistically significant relationship with all five of the health outcome indicators that um, are that align with happiness across any organization. So very, very important. And then you rewrite, rewrite your story or write your story. Um, work should not be the place and the reason why people feel exhausted. Again, back to that CEO that said, if your employees are spending their time off having to re, um, what did I say? Uh, not rejuvenate, revitalize. If that's not, that's not how it should be. You should be able to go go on vacation and enjoy yourself, not just build yourself back up to get back to work. So really understanding what is happening in your work, workplaces in terms of stress and levels of burnout, addressing mental health needs, building cultures where mental health is openly discussed and people are encouraged to actually seek resources. It's not buried under the sand. Um, and then work-life balance resources and how do you maintain a culture of respect in the workplace is very, very important. Um, a, a yeah, really wonderful place to go to look for information if you need it is the Deloitte Global Study. There was one done in 2023. So it's the 12th year they've conducted it. So it's a great place just to get a lot of statistics if you need it. It's funny. So the number two there, they address mental health. So mm -hmm. I had never done that. Normally we were going to have, normally on these, we'd like to have people share stories. I was going to share mine. If anyone wants to see it, I actually wrote an article about it last year. We had a crazy, terrible thing happened. And so I, but I had never seen, I'm 30, I just turned 39. So I'd never seen a, a therapist in my entire life. And I've been seeing one for the past year. And it is the most helpful thing I've ever done. I can't, I, I, I wish everyone, I was just talking. So we have a couple of, of young whip, I say young whippersnappers now at 25 years old. It makes me feel, it makes me feel old, but you know, there, we were joking around about something this morning and, and I said something about, oh, yeah, well, that's not what my therapist thinks. And they said, ah, you don't see a therapist. <laughs> I said, I certainly do. And I said, it's one of the most, you know, the most important hours of, of every month because it really does put things into perspective and it's super helpful. I mean, we've gotten to the point of mentioning, you know, you, everyone gets their routine physical. There's no reason people shouldn't have a routine mental health check-in. There's no reason. And I think there's a stigma of doing it, you know, that that's that whole build culture where it's okay to talk about it. There's a stigma of if you see a therapist, you you know, you're a crazy person and it's it's just it's just not the case. It's a great way to recharge and put perspective on things and it has been infinitely helpful and again if anyone might i don't want to dig into my story too much it's it it's out there so um but it's i i would highly encourage anyone that is on the fence to absolutely go take the step and we're going to talk about some things in a second that might make that a little bit easier but um making it okay to, to talk about openly is that was it's one of the most important lines of this entire presentation so yeah and i would just say i love that you had that voice to say that because there are a lot of, I have three sons and they tell me all the time, oh, therapy doesn't work. I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to waste my time. You know, um, we need that male voice to destigmatize it among men as well. I think that's a huge place that we can improve. But basically all the things that we've talked about is that it's no longer just a nice to have benefit. Well-being is, it is essential. Um, Mackenzie and I have talked about the last two years, we've been busier than we've ever been before. And it's because it's because well-being has risen to the top. So yeah, and it really is. So before we get into to some things here, it really is something. It is the crux. So of that little wheel that we started the, the presentation with around financial, physical, social, community, and career, I could trace any conversation I've had with anybody in the last 24 months to something that that hits directly on one of those topics. And one of the slides earlier shared you know, the reason why people are leaving jobs and every single one of those reasons traces back to one, if not multiple of the areas. And, you know, we even talked with an HR executive just, you know, an hour ago about, you know, she mentioned the two, two things. Number one was lack of leadership support. And number two was lack of career development. Those are the two things, the first two things on why people are leaving their jobs. And they tie in exactly to everything that we're talking about here. So as Carrie said, it's less of 
this is nice to have. The point of this conversation is this, you know, if you're, if you're looking, if you have recruitment goals, if you have people goals, cultural goals, even financial goals that depend on your people, this is absolutely a, a part of the puzzle. And if it, if it already is, that's great. There's an opportunity to put some, some horsepower behind it. If it's not, it's a great opportunity to start. And, and I think that's, that's the example. And so what we're going to show here is we actually had, so over this past summer, I had a, a, a private equity company reach out and they were looking for specifically mental health solutions for their portfolio. So they had a bunch of, a bunch of clients and it was such a prominent ask that this was actually someone they reached out to me out of nowhere on LinkedIn. The people that know me know I'm all over LinkedIn. So, but they reach out and and they said, this is an ask. We need, we need help. We don't even know where to start here. I mean, this is private equity where they're looking at, they're looking at ROI, they're looking at the EBITDA, they're they're just looking at numbers. And this was such a big ask that their companies were, well, if we're going to get to where we need to go, we we need to put some money in here because not only are, are we getting it from our you know, our people team, we're getting it from the actual employees. So we ended up doing a study on, okay, well, this is, you know, there are mental health solutions built into, built into your health plans. Now they're, you know, they're built into EAPs on your long-term disability. There are some carve out, you know, EAPs as well. This is, these are full carve out mental health solutions. And so what we did, and I'm going to kind of rip through this. So, and we'll send this afterwards. I don't want to spend a ton of time, but I just want to give an example of you know, some of the things that we looked at to say, okay, well, let's, let's look at what's out there and let's see, okay, which one from a size standpoint, which one makes sense from a price standpoint, which one makes sense from a reporting, what do we need? Do we have analytics in place so we can really kind of dig into us what makes sense? And we basically came up with this, this study, this was kind of the, the end solution of, okay, Let's talk about the different partners. Let's talk about the, you know, what their background is. Are they credible? How often can people see them? Is it integrated into the medical plan? As you'll hear Carrie and Mackenzie say, the best thing we can do is, is tie all of these things together so that when we're looking at data, it's all tied together. And then most importantly, as anyone can attest, the finding care for especially young teenagers is impossible right now. It's extremely, extremely difficult. So part of this was, okay, well, you know, our portfolio clients, they have younger families. So this is a priority for us. So we looked at the dependent side and said, okay, which one makes sense, this and that. So this is a resource that's out there. Now, these these do have dollar figures attached to them. So it's it's not something that was free, but it was an investment that that was deemed absolutely necessary to make based on you know, based on a private equity portfolio manager, which is if that that's when for me, when someone like that comes to us looking for this, that's when it's like, okay, this is way more, way more at the front end of what's going on in the world than than in the past. So that's a quick, a quick little study. But then we do want to carry has some awesome resources here. We mentioned, we kind of mentioned this um, um, earlier about what some some takeaways are. So these are things that can actually be used like like immediately. So Carrie, I'll let you kind of bebop through these. Yeah, just quickly. This is from the Global Wellness Institute. I encourage you if you've not ever been out to their website to go there. They have a phenomenal amount of resources to use. It's a little more um, academic, but um, some great resources there um, as well as if you can go next slide. One of the things um, as I was researching, and this is not as important to me because I don't, I'm not in HR and benefits technically, but um, productivity measurements. So I don't know if this is something that is well known within your industry, but um, being able to measure that, I thought that was really, really impressive. Um, as well as there's a depression calculator that's out there that I really love. We, we as Pop Health and Wellbeing Consultants know that within a certain population, we expect to see X percentage of diabetics or X percentage of hypertensive within your area of the country, right? Here in the South, we know we love our buttered biscuits, all those types of things. So diabetes is a lot higher than it may be up there in Massachusetts. But depression is one of those that we're still trying to wrap our hands around. And that depression, so maybe the next slide, Jeff. The depression calculator, it talks about the expected percentage of your population based on your age brackets, based on your earnings per low wage to high wage earners. It talks about, um, next slide too. Uh, this is all of the same, but really what to expect as in terms of how many work days would be missed if you're not taking care of your employees who have depression and what is that impact to the company? Really, really a great way to stick 
when you're talking to your CFOs, and we have some CFOs on there, I know they always love to know what what's going to happen in the future. What can I anticipate going forward? So being able to put a dollar amount to that, I think, is very, very important. And then it also takes into account what your absenteeism and presenteeism would be. So really powerful tool. And I encourage everybody to go check that one out. Yeah. And this is, I can attest. So before, you know, three or four years ago, we, as a benefits exercise, our, our entire benefits team basically presented to the Rogers Gray executive team, our renewal. It was just part of, that was a good exercise. And I was actually on the wellness committee and, you know, for me, wellness transparently was not one of my strong suits. So I said, okay, it's a great opportunity to kind of dig into it. And what we found was that, you know, I know, I know the CFO is going to be in there and I know the CFO and I know he's a numbers guy and I know he's going to want to know it. And we could not get anything. We, we got absolutely, and we were self-funded. So we had access to whatever we needed, but we could not get anything from our wellness programs that showed any type of tangible anything. So when it came to creating a business case, you know, I'm a finance person. That was my background. So it's hard to make a business case with absolutely nothing to back up your the, the spend on it. So that's why these things are extremely important when it comes to number one, taking a temperature of what's going on within the organization, but then number two, to try to affect change, especially making a case to the executives with something that they're probably used to seeing. Technology, easy to make a business case. If if we invest X amount of dollars here, it reduces our workflow by X percent. And that savings over the course of time equals Y dollars. Very easy. Measuring depression and mental well-being and how it affects your day-to-day -day is extremely difficult. It's, it's just a task that's not easy to do. So this is one of the tools that we think can be really important is if, if this is a this is a big initiative heading into 2024 to, to take advantage of some of this stuff. And I think, oh yeah, one more. Um, this is just telling you where you can go find the Global um, Wellness Institute's Future of Wellness work paper. They did produce a one in 2023 and every, I think it's every year, technically, they produce an analysis report and it typically focuses on a different topic. But 2023 was about health, happiness and the wellness economy. So I found it to be really, really impressive and um, again, encourage you to go check that out as well. And that's all I have. And we are... Perfect on time. I wanted to leave five minutes. We got one extra minute. So are there any, we, we, went, we went over a lot. So just more any sort of high level questions. And then anyone, obviously, as we mentioned, you know, for for anyone that wants to have these conversations, this is this is all we've been talking about. So we're more than happy to, to kind of dig into any of this. Um, this deck, so all of these, these things are linkable. So you don't have to worry about these links. When you, when I send out the, the PowerPoint, you'll actually get access to all these links and all this information. So, um, and I'll make sure to include that calendar as well. So the wellbeing calendar, it's a great way to sort of just build out a, you know, we don't necessarily have a wellness plan today per se. We like people to be healthy, but we, you know, we, we might need something to help us kind of push, push it forward. It's a great way just to have one topic per month, very manageable, can go out, um, Transparently, you can use chat GPT to write a message around it. We've done that before. It works great. You can kind of then fiddle around with it to, to tailor your company's actual, um, you know, kind of your rhetoric and, and how you talk with with your colleagues. But um, are there any questions for, for Carrie or Mackenzie before we let everyone go? I have one question. Um, and hi, by the way, I'm Sandra Ponectera. I'm new to this group. And it's great to be here. Um, thank you to Jeff for getting me involved. This is this has been a great presentation. Thank you for joining. At least. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just quick question. So there was a slide, I want to say it might have been the third or the fourth slide where you were quantifying, I think it was three or four different types of buckets of cost associated with lack of wellness. And I think one of them was stress. I might mm -hmm. be misremembering that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious. So what went into the stress calculation? What what which particular Sub costs fed into that. So, oh yeah, wait. So is it? Did I miss it? Um, keep it's going. The one with the the four, the the plate guy. He's juggling all the plates. This one, yeah. So the three hundred billion a year. I'm just curious. So what fed into that estimate? Do we have any idea? Honestly, so there's I, a, I don't there's remember, a link. but there is a link. There's okay, a link right, I'll go right into right that. Okay. Yeah. So there's a link okay. to to these studies. So you'll see. Yeah. You, I'm not sure what UML stands for, but. Um, it'll, it'll, I'm sure it'll dig into like what they yeah. actually use as numbers that go in there. So you'll get all of these, a lot of the stats here as well. You'll see there's linkable. This is Gallup. Yeah. Um, there's all linkable links okay. to all, some of Great. these stats Thanks. here. Great question. <laughs> awesome. 
Well, I think that's it. Carrie McKenzie, I know you guys are absolutely jammed this time of year. Thank you so much for taking an hour plus dealing with me prepping it <laughs> the last the last couple of weeks. So we, we really appreciate you guys. And um, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I'll make sure to get the the presentation up that and then the recording might take like a day or two just to clean it up on on both ends so they don't have to hear my rambling on the front and the back end but we'll make sure to get that the link it ends up like a youtube link um so we'll, we'll get that into our group and anyone that's looking for it as well so yeah, thanks for inviting us and um really love the idea of this group so i think you all have one of the hardest jobs in the world i really really do so i appreciate everything that um, you all do to put into your jobs to put into the people so great Awesome. Well, thanks very much. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good holiday next week. Hopefully everyone's doing fun things for Thanksgiving. Stay safe and uh, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next time.